So, hello everybody, and welcome to our talk today on, 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 on adversarial intelligence. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lee Spector, Professor of Computer Science at Amherst College. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to say a little bit about the, the Artificial Intelligence in the Liberal Arts Initiative that is responsible for this series. You can find out more about this initiative at liberal-arts.ai. But I want to give you a quick description of the goals of the initiative and some other things to do. Just uh, about two or three minutes. Um, so as many of you probably realize, AI technology is rapidly becoming pervasive, and it is playing an increasingly important role in nearly every facet of modern society. AI is already having significant impact on science, on commerce, on politics, on medicine, on media, on the arts, and on issues that are connected to almost every facet of life in modern society. In addition, aside from its practical implications, AI raises fundamental questions about the nature of our own minds, uh, what it means to be human, how we should treat one another, and how we should treat non-human minds. It presents tremendous new opportunities and also new and potentially catastrophic dangers. So in light of all of that, um, the premise of the Artificial Intelligence and the Liberal Arts Initiative at Amherst College is that students and faculty in all disciplines should have ways to engage with these issues, to explore and use AI technology, and potentially to play a role in the future that this technology will have in human society. One thing that the initiative will do is present talks like today's, along with other kinds of events. Uh, but we're aiming to do more as well. For example, providing accessible software and hardware, along with mentors who can uh, work with students and faculty across the disciplines to understand and make use of AI technology. Um, we have some exciting plans in the works, uh, but we're also quite open to new ideas. And I am very much interested in hearing from each of you about how you would see this init initiative interacting with your own concerns, your work, and for those of you on the faculty, the concerns and work of your students. As some of you may have seen, we previously hosted a talk by Laurie Thompson from UMass on a symbiotic future for mach machine learning and the humanities. A talk by Nerman Dawe from Obviously AI on No Code AI. A talk by Su Lin Blodgett from Microsoft Research called Towards Building Equitable Language Technologies. And just last week, a talk by philosopher Susan Schneider on AI and the Future of Your Mind. Um, on Wednesday, November 10th is the next event after this one. We'll uh, be holding an event in conjunction with Amherst's Center for Humanistic Inquiry, or CHI as you may know it, called Making Robots Good People. Uh, which will feature a discussion with uh, philosopher Laura Sizer from Hampshire College and Mount Holyoke College, computer scientist Heather Pondberry from Mount Holyoke College, philosopher Joe Moore from here at Amherst College, computer scientist Phil Thomas from UMass Amherst, and myself. So that's going to be more of a panel discussion on uh, intersections uh, between ethics and AI. Um, I hope we'll see you at these and uh, other upcoming events in the AI and liberal arts series. Um, and check liberal-arts.ai for information about this and uh, keep up with what we're doing. So this afternoon, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Yunime O'Reilly, who will be giving a talk called Adversarial Intelligence. Uh, Yunime O'Reilly is the leader of the AnyScale Learning for All, or Alpha, group at the MIT Computer Science and AI Lab. Uh, Alpha focuses on machine learning technology, evolutionary algorithms, and data science for knowledge mining, prediction, analytics, and optimization. Alpha also conducts research in cybersecurity and software analysis. Dr. O'Reilly is the author of over 150 academic papers and has served as the vice chair of the ACM Special Interest Group on Evolutionary Computation, or ACM SIG EVO, as the chair of the largest international uh, evolutionary Computation Conference, GECKO. Um, she serves as a senior editor for several major journals and as an advisor to national laboratories and startups. Her PhD at Carleton University was one of the world's first on the AI topic of genetic programming. Aside from that, I can tell you that I have known Yuname for many years, and she is one of the most brilliant and innovative scientists working in AI today. I've been fortunate to have her serve as the area editor for data analytics and knowledge discovery at the journal I edit, Genetic Programming and Evolvable Machines. And I always jump at the opportunity to work with her, whether on original research or on service to the research community. 
Um, I can't quite remember if she volunteered proactively or if she just agreed immediately when I asked her, uh, but I know that she committed to speaking as a part of this series within a few minutes of my telling her about the AI and the liberal arts idea. Um, so with that, I am delighted to give you Dr. Yuname O'Reilly, who will give a talk that will be followed by a brief Q&A session, and we're aiming to wrap up by around 5.30. Thank you. Yuname. Okay, well, hi, everyone. I'm afraid there will be some background noise during my talk that I can't prevent, um, but we'll let's let's just move on despite of it. Um, I'm going to set my clock so that I don't run over. And let's go. So I want to start by thanking Lee uh, for the invitation to speak about my research, especially in such a intersectional ser a series, you know, AI and the liberal arts. Um, I really uh, commend uh, Lee and the others in the who are working on this initiative uh, because it's very timely. I really wish I could come to Amherst College and see you all and meet you and discuss this in person. Um, I'd really like to see Amherst College in action. Um, and, and I have to say the college has caught my attention uh, with the news that you won't be using legacy in admissions. Um, and as a as an immigrant and first gen, uh, that's super. Um, uh, all, all the more reasons to come see it if I ever get to. Um, so let me begin. In my abstract, I mentioned a number of systems which share uh, vulnerability to adversarial conflicts. So I wanted to start by taking a look at a couple of these. Um, and I've chosen them because I study them, but there's other examples out there. Um, and then um, allow me from after introducing them to work them into my context, which is, you know, I'm interested in abstracting a, a general stylistic description of adversarial settings and behavior within them. Um, and I need to do that computationally. So I want to tell you a little bit about artificial adversarial intelligence. Um, and to make that really concrete, um, I'm going to connect um, my study into artificial AI uh, with an example that I've given you at the beginning, and that will be the taxation system I'm going to describe to you. Um, and then um, I'd like to allude to some ongoing work, which is in this scope, and time permitting, we can talk about it, um, because I'd really like your feedback and your ideas as I move forward. So one setting where we see adversarial uh, engagement and behavior is cyberspace. It consists of computer networks uh, where there's this basic right to private, privately hold some assets, to establish a perimeter which in, in which you can exist, and to conduct legitimate business. But what we see is intentionally malicious behavior, that of adversaries who come along and they really, their, their goal is to disrupt and to steal and to invade uh, these cyber networks. Um, here's an example. Um, it's called des denial of service attacks. Um, and the particular example I'm showing you is um, actually executed by a botnet. So in this uh, scenario, there is a botnet operator. And this is a nefarious entity. I've drawn them as a, pi a pirate. Um, and they control the ability to uh, place software illegitimately in different servers across the internet. And that software has the ability to, upon a centralized command saying go, uh, to turn the server that it's on into a zombie that sends many, many messages all to one target. Right? And if you overwhelm a target with lots of messages, it can no longer process them and it starts it stops being able to handle its legitimate behavior because it has to handle all this illegitimate illegitimate behavior that's coming from these uh, bots that are in this big network so this is a a common an unfortunately uncommon uh kind of attack denial of service it's not always operated perpetrated by a botnet um, but it's an example of this sort of adversarial engagements one sees in cyberspace the other thing to note is that these adversarial engagements keep going. We can't seem to stop them. And there's really a, a set of escalation that's taking place, a dynamics of escalation that's taking place. So here's a, a report on the state of the internet from a um, content service provider, Akamai. Um, and what it's showing you here 
is different attacks um, and they range from simple to sophisticated um, and as you pass them along the timeline which is going up uh, um, uh, on the y-axis what you see on one side is all the um, attacks and on the other side you see the defenses that have been deployed and what you can see is this sort of tit for tat or um, uh, attack and counter measure uh, dynamic going on um, and it escalates from simple ways of being attacked and simple ways of stopping it to more and more complex ways of being attacked and the need for more and more complex ways to uh, defend yourself. And so this particular dynamic is taking place in cyberspace, but not, but, but it's not exclusive to cyberspace. Another place where it takes place is in the realm of, of finance um, and particularly, you know, when entities are taxed. So in this case, uh, there's an engagement environment, which is, which sort of is central um, centralized through the Internal Revenue Code and the whole uh, process of tax collection. So the Internal Revenue Code unfortunately has these very unobvious and hidden loopholes um, that can be detected by very complex study. So in the adversarial engagements we see in the taxation realm, we have auditors and non-compliant tax agents. And um, on one side we see the um, the, the evaders uh, being suppressed uh, from their from using their strategies by audits, um, but as time moves on, they get cleverer. They examine the code for more, and they then get the upper position over audits. And then the internal revenue system uh, has to detect that its audits are no longer working. It has to make changes to the code, changes to its audits, and then it gets the upper hand over the taxation evaders. Uh, but unfortunately, this is really an arms race. It's uh, oscillatory, and at any given time, um, only one of these two adversarial um, actors is in is in control. So, uh, is this a serious problem? Yeah, it is. Right? Uh, you know, we have a natural system where we're trying to, uh, you know, um, fairly tax, um, and yet there's uh, the ability for some people in the environment to adversarially avoid paying taxes or um, circumvent paying taxes. Um, and let me just give you an example of how this works. And it's pretty tricky, but let's, I, I'm just gonna really simplify one example and show you how it extrapolates to a much more complex situation, which is let's imagine, you know, that, Ms., that Ms. Jones owns a house um, and wants to, you know, bought it for $120 and now is about to sell it to Ms. Brown for 200, right? And that difference between 120 and $200 is 80. And what we would normally expect is that Jones would pay 80, would pay tax on that $80 profit they've made from the sale of the house. And what happens um, is that the tax code in trying to avoid double taxing Jones um, has left loopholes that allow uh, tax to be completely evaded. And it would happen in a scenario like such as this where the house uh, is transferred to a shell company, that shell is transferred twice, um, and then a side company can actually, you know, offer to pay for the house without actually sending any money. Um, but because they offer to pay $200, um, the value of the house is stepped up to 200. And now when the house is actually legitimately sold to Brown, because it was registered as having a $200 value, there's no tax being paid. Okay, that's actually a, a real scheme. It's called um, installment sale bogus optional basis. And these transactions take place so that a gain of something like $80, but on a different scale, can be hidden. And uh, um, how does it get hidden? Well, uh, there's all sorts of different companies. Uh, different enterprises file tax ind independently. They don't, uh, the, the, the Internal Revenue Service doesn't get to see all of the filings, you know, as one connected system. They see different parts of the system. And each of these independent operators is really reporting on the cycle you saw in the last uh, system, where it's embedded into a much, much larger scale uh, set of transactions. So think of the particular structure you just saw for the IBOB uh, evasion. And what we see now is tax accountants are able to set up for the wealthy um, different corporations and trusts in a network that allows assets to be shifted around and values for those assets to be uh, bumped up without extra taxation 
um, and still those assets can be transferred. So it's really, really hard to find these particular things and they're um, embedded in big sizes. And one way, you know, if you're the IRS, how do you find this out? Because you're getting all these sort of independent pieces. Well, one can look at the growth in the kinds of uh, corporations and trusts that are being used financially in general. And this is a fascinating picture because, um, you know, if you look at uh, how many partnerships are involved in a particular um, constellation of um, assets, um, you know, and, to, and, and you look on the left hand side here, what we have here is on the x axis is the size of these networks. And then what we have on the y axis is um, how many there are, how many partnerships, um, sorry, how many of these size partnerships exist. Uh, the light blue bar is 2002 and then the change is showing over over 10 years is showing with the blue bar, the dark blue bar in 2011. So what you see here is 162% increase in the number of small partnerships, but check out over here on the right. Over here on the right, there are now partnership networks between 100,000 to 500,000 nodes in size. And whereas 10 in 2002, we might have seen 57 of those there's now an increase of 823%. So this is a clue to the IRS that uh, these structures are being used um, and they're probably not correlated with equivalency in tax payments. Um, and this is, uh, you know, sort of not just a theoretical problem and it doesn't just sit inside um, the IRS and the um, Internal Revenue um, uh, Board. Um, I think you've heard about it in the news, right? So uh, when we were working on this, uh, it was the Panama Papers that were uh, leaked. And these are papers that sort of show how offshore lawyers and accountants have created um, uh, uh, various partnership structures to hide the gains on assets and to produce artificial losses. And um, once they get out, the problem is that they're very hard to detect. Um, so this is an interesting example of, uh, you know, um, taxation gone awry. Well, what do the taxation and cyber networks have in common that I've shown you here? Well, they're both sort of vulnerable to adversarial conflict and arms races, because let me tell you, when the IRS gets rid of the, um, the scheme that allows the house transfers to be hidden, um, another one pops up. I mean, they're called IBOB, DAD. Um, it has been an endless round of um, the IRS applying defenses to attacks um, and more clever adaptation and learning by the attackers to find even more nefarious loopholes. Or sometimes the um, IRS actually introduces um, uh, more complexities into the tax and, and sets up new loopholes as well. Um, but what I, when I look at these systems, I think, wow, they are basically exhibiting and fostering this very naturally occurring intelligence that's adversarial. And that's what um, interests me, right? I am a computer scientist and my focus is on artificial intelligence. And AI to me is this quest to make computers as intelligent as humans and to make them intelligent in ways that even humans are not. Right? And that's really because I, I will accept that humans are biological and computers are silicon, so we can expect that. And today what we're really talking about, for in, 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 uh, from my perspective, is artificial adversarial intelligence. So if I want to study this um, as a computational intelligence, uh, what do I do? How do I proceed? Well, one approach is to abstract and model, sorry, is to abstract and model. And why do I want to abstract? Well, that's going to let me focus on what I think is salient in these adversarial uh, agents that I think of as intelligent. And I won't get bogged down in irre irrelevant detail, but I'm pretty loose here with what a model is. Um, uh, you're going to see some hand waving. Maybe my papers are a little bit more formal and you can look for them there. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is abstract out a very general description of these settings and offer stylistic elements that describe the adversarial intelligence. All right, so here's what I do. I um, assume that these adversarial settings have agents in them and, or actors, 
And these actors have conflicting objectives. What's good for one is bad for the other, right? We know the whole Wiley, Coyote, and Roadrunner um, paradigm. And I'm, I'm, I'm invested actually in environments where we can talk about, you know, one, one side or one competitor in this adversarial pairing as being good in favor and the others being out of favor of the bad side, right? And within my model, adversarial in, in engagements take place when these two actors with different objectives, conflicting objectors, objectives engage. Um, and they can, as a result of their engagement, they can draw back and they can look at the engagement and decide whether it went according to their objectives or not. And they can get some measure on their performance in that engagement. Um, and I assume that that's always measurable. Um, I also uh, assume that there's some cost to adversarial strategies. Um, and it might be that the costs are asymmetric um, and there may even be different resources for competing uh, depending on what each adversary has in terms of um, um, uh, abstract properties. So more on, more on this intelligence, right? So I assume these adversaries are intelligent. And what that means to me is that they have access to a vast repertoire of strategies. Not all of them are equally useful, um, but these strategies are available to them to try and achieve their objectives. And I assume given that when they engage, they can get feedback on the quality of their performance relative to their objective, I assume that they can learn from that information. Right? And because they learn, it means that and adapt, which is the facet of intelligence I'm interested in, it allows them to go back and engage again differently from what they did the first time. And it's this adaptation that takes place through learning um, on both sides of the equation, both competitors, that leads to the adversarial dynamics I'm interested in studying these arms races or these uh, oscillatory behaviors where you know, of or um, oscillatory states of control where one is dominant and the other is not. And uh, finally, I also assume that these arms races and this learning and adaptation is really playing out in an ecosystem where there's multiple players. Um, and that's multiple players, players on each side or multiple actors on each side of, of each of the competitive types. And all of the objectives of everyone on one side is common, are the same, um, but in general, because of this great behavioral repertoire, I assume they can try uh, different ways of behaving and they could behave differently. And what this gives me is this sort of rich variations in each repertoire and set of, uh, and, and uh, simulated behavior um, from each side of my competition. So, so this allows me to sort of describe adversarial engagement and adversarial intelligence. Uh, but what good is that if I don't know how to code up algorithms uh, that implement this kind of model or this stylized uh, paradigm I've defined? Well, for me, the pathway has been to follow the uh, most sal one, one salient aspect of the dynamics, which is that these two populations co-evolve with respect to each other. Um, and here's the classic fox and hare. You know, the one could hunt the other out of existence, but their populations co-evolve um, with adaptations to the defenses and the offensive powers. Um, that allow this sort of co-evolutionary existence, but this kind of arms race or uh, dynamics uh, where there's constant change um, going on between the uh, uh, strategies being employed uh, by each side in their competition with each other. And we've seen this in taxation and cybersecurity, and now we I see it in nature. Um, so what I'm seeing in nature really is that whether a population is fox or hare, this population is able to adaptively improve over time. What's the mechanism underlying that? The mechanism underlying that is evolution, right? Well, and coevolution. So natural selection is playing upon both these populations in terms of uh, selectively favoring the fitter 
um, uh, variants in each population. Uh, genetic inheritance is in play when these uh, when a pair of uh, actors uh, genetically reproduce um, and have offspring. And as offspring replace their parents, uh, what we see is the genetic adaptations being brought out in new behaviors. And this kind of evolutionary co-adaptation um, can be algorithmically translated. Um, but before we go to that algorithmic translation, just let me show you a few more of these sort of defenses because they're interesting to look at. And, and you'll sort of see that the argument of foxes and hares goes beyond that. Um, here I've, I've shown you, I'm showing you um, various um, examples of organisms that have, have evolved with this defensive goal of not being eaten. So we've got, you know, the skunk with its stripe that tells its predators to stay away. And then, you know, if they can't see the stripe, it has the tail with the, with the scent. Uh, we see camouflage as a defense um, here in two cases. And uh, we also see just like the fact, this outgrowth of spines that sort of, you know, physically prevent um, at attack. There's also natural, exam um, natural examples of attacking uh, mechanisms. Uh, you know, pretty obviously you can see things here with uh, antlers and speed. Um, but if you look really carefully on the bottom left, what you will see, though, is an interesting uh, predator-prey dynamic, um, which you might think is the wasp preying upon something on the flower. But in fact, the attacker here is this little yellow spider that has evolved to have the same color as the plant, or to be able to have the same color as the flower it sits on, and it lures in the wasp by having a color that matches uh, uh, the feeding spot of the, of, the, of the wasp. So very, very ingenious natural examples of defenses and attacks. And all of these have evolved and most of them have co-evolved. So how do we take those ideas from nature and co-evolution and computationalize them? Well, I do it with a genetic algorithm. Uh, a genetic algorithms uh, set up uh, you know, computer representations of populations of agents. Um, and through computer programming, we can evaluate uh, an agent and see how fit it is, and then write an algorithm that essentially is like natural selection, that favors and selects the more um, fit members of a population for reproduction. It's very easy in a computer algorithm to copy um, the code for an agent, and then it can be, you know, genetically that, that forms a genetic inheritance mechanism. And then we can apply some very simple changes to the representation to create variations of the um, parental um, solution here. So this is typically an iterative process. We run algorithms with generations. And so you have pop a population, and some population will iterate many times in each generation. We see fitness evaluation, um, parental selection, and genetic inheritance to form a new population that that moves on in the next iteration but i need coevolution, not not evolution which you see in the genetic algorithm so the solution there is to just take two genetic algorithms and fuse them together where they actually evaluate the fitness of the agents in their population so here we have on the top in blue a defender population in my algorithms um, and they this is a genetic algorithm um, and members of the defensive population can be evaluated and selected and varied to get new members of a defensive population. And blue and red, members of the attack population can be evaluated, selected, and varied to get new members of the attack population. But what's super important here is that I can draw algorithmically, we're able to draw one member of the defense population and one member of the attack population at a time, and we can pair them up and we can compete them against each other. And when we can algorithmically compete them against each other, we can get a measure of how well they each did, and we can pass that information to each of them. We can even take one defender out and have them compete one at a time, every member of the attack population. And then we can get an estimate of their fitness over that entire attack population. And we can do the same thing for defenders, obviously. So this is what this is my workhorse, a coevolutionary algorithm where I have populations of attackers and defenders, and these can be um, uh, tax evaders versus tax auditors 
or they could be cyber attacks versus cyber defenses. So to make that more concrete, I'm going to show you um, a project we had called Stealth, where we actually co-evolved tax evasion or tax non-compliance with auditing. All right, that's a little bit of a, um, a description of the paper. Um, and we call it Stealth, but it stands for, it has a nice, that acronym has some meaning. And here's what we do though. Um, looking over here on the left, we conceptually create a tax evader um, and they own a tax evasion scheme. And we implement a tax evasion scheme as a set of transactions, financial transactions, like I showed you in that IBOB scheme, that notion of creating trusts and moving assets through these trusts and, and, and selling assets and taking, making use of basis transactions to change values uh, on the, using the tax code. Um, and what every um, tax evader in our coevolutionary genetic algorithm wants to do is eliminate or minimize the risk that their transaction sequence, uh, which is their scheme, will be audited by the IRS and perhaps uh, found out. We also model the auditors and auditors each have a score sheet and that score sheet um, is full of things that they can observe about a set of transactions that belong to um, a tax evader. So essentially it's a, a way of observing the tax evasion scheme. And with those observables, they can put a score, they can place um, a value of importance over each observable. And if they see the observable, they multiply it by the weight. And when they look at all the observables in a, in a, in a tax evasion scheme, they can come up with a number that uh, they can translate into a likelihood that they should audit this um, tax scheme. And what we do is we therefore create a system, a framework uh, that has two components. In one component, we model the taxation system. Um, and in another component, we, mod we basically model the behavior I've been talking about, the evasion and the auditing. Um, and in this component, we expect to see adaptation of, this, of, of the strategies and coevolution of the um, auditors and the evaders. So let's look at that taxation system. What we do there is we actually looked at the law and we looked at a very, very small section of the Internal Revenue Code um, and we were able to um, represent it um, as a calculation that could be done over a tax scheme and could actually derive some score, uh, 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 sorry, a, a tax calculation, so we could see how much something was taxed. Um, and what we also have in this taxation system is a way of scoring audit risks, right? And so what happens is the law-based, the, the tax calculator is given a taxation, a, 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 a transaction sequence or a taxation scheme, and it comes up with a tax liability, how much is owed for the financial transactions that have just been um, taken. And the scoring and audit risk component uh, applies the audit weights to the observables and comes back with a risk of audits. And on the other side, we have a coevolutionary system, which consists of a population of transaction sequences, uh, which are essentially trans, uh, uh, evasion schemes and these represent the tax evaders and then we have a population that represents the auditors um, observable weights on the observables and we call this the population the audit weight and what happens with stealth is that we go back and forth and we run our genetic algorithm over um, the uh, fitness values that come back um, from the scoring of the audit risk and um, uh, looking at the tax liability so successful tax evaders uh, get low risk of audits and they have uh, tax liabilities that are lower than expected and successful auditors have award high scores to uh, tax evaders that have paid much less than their true liability should have been. Um, and when we run this system with the coevolutionary algorithm adapting transa transaction sequences and audits weights, what we're able to, to replicate is some of the dynamics that you see with um, uh, the taxation system. So here we can actually show you something like over the course of 
of time, time is here as generations on the x-axis, we can look at where the weights are for the auditor. And we can see in different colors, we're showing whether the auditor is placing weights on annuities or connected entities or, or other various observables. And what we're watching here is the shift in the emphasis of auditors on different observables in color, on the background color. And what you're seeing in black in the foreground is the fitness of the evaders. And what you're seeing is initially uh, the audits are very, very strong, and, but ev the evaders evolve against them. And therefore the, um, uh, sorry, let me get this right. This is transaction sequence. So this is the fitness of the evader. So initially the evader is fit, but as the auditors shift their observables and the weights to the right observables that reflect what the uh, evaders are doing, the fitness of the evaders goes down. But then the evaders keep evolving and they can finally come up with a scheme that the auditors are not looking at because it uses different observables. And so for a while they have ascendancy until the auditors discover the right observables, which pushes the evaders fitness down. And what you're seeing here is this coevolutionary dynamics uh, between uh, the ad adaptation of both the evaders and the defenders. So the team here was uh, a technology and policy student, Jacob Rosen, who has since uh, gone to do startups, and uh, a research scientist in my group, Eric, Eric Hemberg. Um, it was a three or four or five year project. There was much, much, much to it than the picture I've sketched. If you want to learn more, we have information. Um, we, were, we, were, we were obviously um, assisted uh, by people who were representing the IRC through a contract and they were at the MITRE Corp and they're also, credit goes to them for explaining a lot of taxation to us so that we could actually make this modeling be uh, relevant. And the thing is that the battle never finishes, right? So uh, while I showed you in the earlier example, um, the Panama Papers being discovered, which were a lot about these shell games happening uh, just recently, right? In the last couple of weeks, uh, the Washington Post broke out the Pandora Papers and the Pandora Papers are exposing all these uh, um, tax havens that still exist in various countries. Um, so that's the arms race, right? Because, you know, after the Panama Papers, you know, lots of work was done to try and pull back the ability for these tax havens and these tax transactions to take place. Turns out they've evolved around them. Um, and now what's it, now what is, what, what, what is taking the place of auditing now is the government is trying to, the, the American government and all sorts of other governments in the, I think it's in the G11, are trying to work together to establish like, I think it's a constant uh, corporate tax of 15%. Um, that will end the tax havens again. And, you know, it's actually the G20 that was doing that. And guess what? Even after they've announced it, before they've even got it running, someone's already figured out how to come up with a new tax haven. So just a sort of a picture that in reality, you know, um, in these ecosystems, intelligence is always there. It's in complex forms. Um, and it creates, you know, in, when there's competitive and conflicting objectives, it creates these really, interesting co-evolutionary dynamics that are uh, really em embody intelligence. So I look at um, artificial intelligence and I've sort of whipped you through a fast picture of it. And really, if you look at my approaches, they're machine learning approaches. And today I told you that I was using genetic algorithms. And so that's a bio inspired uh, form of machine learning. Uh, but my group also looks at data driven ways of um, approaching uh, adversarial intelligence. Uh, we, you know, we use deep learning and we look at some sort of uh, competitive minimax optimizations in a lot of our work. And this has allowed us not just to work on taxation and to look on look work at the, the uh, denial of service attacks, but of late we've been looking at different kinds of network security. We've also been looking at cyber hunting. We've been looking at um, whether it's possible to, you know, not uh, whether it's possible to attack the machine learning models that detect malware and what one can do to protect those models and make them more robust to attacks. Um, but there's, there's more to add here as in terms of applications and there's more to add here in terms of methods. 
Um, and that's sort of being driven here from an interest I have that I think is, 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 is quite timely. And that is that I'm interested in, and I mentioned this in my abstract, but I haven't mentioned it yet, which is I'm really interested in disinformation because that's adversarial dynamics, right? Um, here, this is a picture of a database um, and a website that exists um, called EU versus Disinfo. It's funded by the European Union and it catalogs all the Russian-based um, media newspaper articles. I think, it, I think it covers just newspapers that are sent Russian-based newspaper articles that contain misinformation and dis, well, disinformation deliberately against countries in the EU. You know, and disinformation can be sort of state driven, which is, you know, going taking us back to important geopolitical problems to study, but it also can be health related, right? Um, what's just happened in COVID is what we've, is that the world has not been able to unite to fit, co to fight COVID. I and mean, a lot of it is because we have been propagating disinformation about COVID's origins, about COVID's um, strength, and about the vaccines we have. Um, and so disinformation abounds. And I look at disinformation as, again, an adversarial <coughs> activity that's taking place in social media, um, as well as in, in the news, where you know one side is trying to do the right thing. And that's why we technologically created some of these platforms. It was It was for democratizing the world. It was for furthering and amplifying the voice of uh, misunderstood and, and underrepresented communities. Um, but it has been adversarially gained to with disinformation to disrupt the intended use of these platforms. So, you know, if we go to something like Facebook, we don't have do you know we might actually have the equivalent of the panama papers right the panama papers are you know are the ones in taxation where we found out that this you know where, where what was exposed was all these initially tax havens in panama right well the equivalent is you know the 2016 election where uh, what was exposed was that Facebook was passing data to Cambridge Analytica and Cambridge Analytica was um, acquiring huge amounts of descriptors for massive swaths of the American population and providing it to the Republican Party. Right? What's the equivalent of today's Pandora papers? Well, maybe it's the whistleblower Frances Haugen. Right? She has now finally come out with information that exposes that even Facebook itself knows that adversarial behavior is taking place on its platform and it's not actually uh, fighting that adversarial behavior unless it doesn't conflict with their business objectives. So I'm really interested in this adversarial dynamics, the adversarial dynamics of disinformation. Um, and so how do you get started? It's such a big field and I've been looking at it and admiring all the work in it. We're going to get started by actually acquiring more expertise in natural language techniques because so much of disinformation is textual. Um, there's also disinformation that obviously is, is uh, video, um, but this textual information abounds. You find it on Facebook, you find it on Twitter. Um, and one of the things we're interested in is um, birdwatch. So Twitter is piloting a program where users can actually flag disinformation and write a note. And then if you write a good note, other people can come along and up up, um, uh, give you a thumbs up and a, and, a, and a vote of support for your note. Um, so we're really interested in understanding with text processing, what is the substance of the disinformation? What is the substance of the argumentation and in the rebuttals of these notes? And amongst the notes that have lots of um, thumbs up or lots of you know people telling them they're good, what is it that makes them better than other notes and more noticeable? So that's one disinformation question we'll ask. Um, and another one we're looking at is, is sort of based on this data we find in EU versus Disinfo. And they were really interested, again, in argumentation and sentiment um, and understanding whether we can uh, see particular strategies uh, being deployed for underrepresented groups or specific to uh, types of politicians or particular countries. So my takeaway 
uh, hopefully giving everyone some time to, to, to talk about these ideas of adversarial intelligence is really that adversarial intelligence lies within systems where there are competitions and costs and, and learning takes place, right? And, and you have to have the learning to get the intelligence. You need to be able to adapt to uh, someone else's behavior um, according to your performance against the objectives, which is why I can model these things with coevolutionary algorithms. Um, and now the question is how we constructed technological systems that support adversarial exploitation by intelligent adversaries, you know, and uh, that's where I leave it in our hands for discussion today. I just, uh, before I, I leave some acknowledgement to my funders and thanks to this uh, amazing group of students that work with me in the Alpha group um, who have at uh, various points in their, in their history uh, worked on either the tax project or the cyber project or many of the other projects that my group works on in adversarial intelligence. And I'll pass it over to you, Lee. Thank you, Yuna May. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but I'm going to hold my tongue for a little bit and see if anybody has a question. You could do your hand raise, or you could actually just unmute and speak. Let's see what we're here. I have a, a few questions. Um, one of the things I'm wondering about is in this co-evolution of um, attacker and defender, this makes a whole lot of sense in um, what I think of as soft settings where you can get a little bit of gain and see um, it, it's continuous in that way. And what this makes me think of is scenarios where you have like zero day attacks of I didn't find something that kind of works and make it a little better and make it a little better. I looked at something and developed a brand new attack by watching and then deployed on the, the scene. And so one question is if you could speak to if the methods are applicable to those sorts of um, settings. And then also you had this um, plot that showed sort of this sawtooth behavior. And I'm wondering if what's happening in those sharp upticks of the fitness of the evader is a like zero day tech discovered or if instead it's a um, sudden broad adoption of something that had been discovered earlier. Those are great questions. Thanks for asking them. Um, so I'm constrained computationally to define the space of all behaviors for attackers and defenders. So theoretically, nothing is, is discovered that's, that's outside the space of my behavioral <clears throat> repertoire. Um, so in that case, if it's not in there, it would be a zero day and I don't have it. On the other hand, if my behavioral repertoire space is so big, there could be things that, um, there could be uh, attacks within that space, strategies for attacks within that space that haven't been seen before and they're very different from other ones. And those could be interpreted as zero day attacks. But I think it goes back to your second question, which is, you know, you sort of said, when these people, when, when these systems are evolving, are we seeing incremental evolution and then the takeover of some incremental solution in the population? Or are we seeing a, a sharp change in a very distinctively new behavior and then the rest of the population following it? And it really depends on um, the both the parameters of my simulation, how much I allow exploration over exploitation of existing systems. And the way I can find that out, I mean, what's important about having a simulation system is I need to be able to see whether one, one or the other is the case. And that's really what I was doing in my sawtooth plot with the, with the colors on the background. I was sort of saying, well, what is it that the attackers are doing? And I know what the attackers are doing by seeing what observables the auditors are picking up. And there you could actually see that the attacks were um, changing in nature. They were actually quite, um, quite varied. And this was not a particularly large search space. It was not a particularly long simulation. Um, let me see if we could go back to it. But uh, 
it really does speak to the fact that I feel I can't answer, I can't say yes to that zero day because the zero day would have to be encoded inside my behavioral space. And if it's encoded inside my behavioral space, then I already know about it, right? Where I, if I really, really, truly want a zero day, I have to take, I have to go down a level of abstraction and really look at the codes that are being used to do some of these attacks. And in that case, I would be evolving the software there. And when I evolve the software there, it would involve um, perturbations to the code and uh, modifications to the code that could bring it into the uh, possibility of being something that hadn't been discovered before. And while I have toyed around with that, that's a pretty dangerous thing to do. Um, and you have to do it under a lot of different conditions. And so uh, that was something we stepped away from. I'm gonna jump in with a question that I got in a direct message um, from Jaya. Um, uh, which uh, says that a recent New York Times article says that the uh, thumbs up model used by Facebook is a problem in itself. Um, if so, then how will the Twitter research that wants to study adversarial intelligence using likes work? Or, um, that is, are the AI That's an excellent question. No, I get it because today I was sitting down with a student who's looking at the Birdwatch project. Pro project. I actually have three students uh, looking at it right now and they're all just initially getting the data and we're starting to look at it and I was like come on Twitter's using its own stuff on us right how do you you know what happens in Twitter if you want to actually get lots of views well then you need to have lots of followers and when you have lots of followers you know that's what these up 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 votes are these up votes are just the same Twitter mechanism being used to find the disinformation and I'm not sure that that couldn't be gamed uh, entirely and I think uh, clearly, in Facebook, this is the problem because both the algorithm is um, set up parametrically to have various preferences for what is shown to you on your um, news list or shown to you when you log in or as you spend more time on the platform. And it's influenced by people's behavior um, in terms of upvoting things for popularity. And so it's a dangerous mechanism. It's a very, very dangerous mechanism because taken adversarially used, uh, you can all of a sudden very quickly put very, very dangerous content quickly in front of people. And I believe that Facebook turned down its use of that in the algorithm of, of like sort of propagating very popular uh, content during the 2020 election. Facebook had a lot of controls in the 2020 election. They would say, I've, I've been reading a lot about this uh, with these papers that came out. Um, it appeared that they worked to a large extent, but Facebook turned them all off the day after the election. Right, and so they know what controls will actually help, but they were, they were investing a vast amount of human effort and automatic effort into uh, preventing the disinformation just around the election. And I'm not sure they have a scalable solution to doing it around every issue that could actually pop up. And they're still gonna be vulnerable to these zero days, new topics that come up and you can't um, grab them without them sort of uh, becoming entrenched. And you know, disinformation is a very interdisciplinary subject. It's not just about technology and the platforms. Um, it's about social behavior. And it's about psychology and there's a lot of psychology that says that once you've read something it's very very hard to forget it um if it has the right saliency and the right sort of sentiment um in it thank you i'm gonna just echo uh, jaya also shared this uh, new york times link uh related to that but i'm just echoing to the, to the general chat um i think we have time for another question or two um I've got, got, like you've got another one. Yeah, I've got one to follow up, but I don't, if any yeah. student chooses to interrupt me, by all means, go for it. Um, to what you were just saying about uh, Facebook, I'm always hesitant at the hope that companies will fix problems that they introduced. And I'm wondering if we're in a situation, and maybe Facebook is currently in the situation, where disinformation makes money. Um, do you have they are. any <laughs> they are in a situation with disinformation makes money i mean apparently it was over a billion pounds uh where they circulated some of the um ads uh for vaccine 
uh, it was actually the New England, not the England, the British Medical Journal actually documented how much money they made um, propagating misinformation around vaccines. So yes, they are making money by this. The parallel I see, and I don't know if it will take place, is look what happened with taxation. Taxation uh, resumed its arms race after some of it had been exposed by outside parties, right? Then what happened was everyone cooperated to try and get rid of it, right? It was the collective cooperation of the G20 getting to the root of the problem, which is corporate taxation um, being different in different countries um, and allowing countries that have no corporate morals to, to, to let this thing take place. So I'm wondering if that's, and that's legislative, right? And so I'm wondering if that's pointing us to where a direction that's possible with disinformation in that there needs to be, you know, there's already actions done by uh, Europe with GDPR, GPDR, the uh, data protection rights that the EU has ex extended to people over having their information shared. That's a direct result of Cambridge Analytica, uh, plus many other things. Um, but now what we have, based on the fact that the second exposure has come and it's internally uh, documented, documented, not externally documented, um, the Americans are threatening, the American legislators are, are threatening to act. Um, but that's not a coordinated action, coordinated action, and I think coordinated action may be one of the ways we can finally get a handle on this, because until you deconstruct the economics of it, um, you, you could just have corporate, one, one way of, of, of handling this is make people pay. And when they pay, they don't have to use ads. If I paid for Facebook, Facebook wouldn't have to sell my data uh, to people who could advertise to me. And that would break up the business model. Um, but that would take global cooperation as well in terms of understanding how data gets shifted around through global bar bar uh, global borders. Um, so my hope is that some of the stuff that's happening with taxation, really the solution is one of cooperation and legislation. And, and there's going to have to be lots of other things. I mean, we're going to have to educate people. We're going to have to still have things like uh, bird watch that are community oriented or other things that um, do authentication. Um, it's a multifaceted set of fronts that we have to move on to deal with it. Thank you for that, Ian May. Um, I don't know if that's hopeful. Um, but uh, you came back to Birdwatch, which again is subject eyes first to the same adversarial. So I guess we shall see. Um, I still have some questions, but I'm not going to take everybody's time to ask them. I'll, I'll, I'll bug you about them later. Um, uh, but I would like everybody to join me, maybe unmute or do whatever you can with any eye contact. <laughs> thank uh, Dr. O'Reilly again for her talk. Um, and, and thank everybody, thank you all for joining us. And I hope you will join us. Um, uh, many of you who are on campus in an in-person discussion with that panel on November 10th, uh, the Chi uh, Salon, as they call it. And um, I look forward to seeing you at more events. And my final plea, if you have other ideas for AI and the liberal arts events or activities or ways to engage, especially those of you who have friends um, who don't do anything with computation, um, but should be informed and should be involved and should have a seat at the table, uh, please um, get in contact with me or one of the students who are helping. And you can see all of that on liberal-arts.ai. So thanks so much. I'll see you next time.